opportunities in Jordan and Egypt. Jordan and Egypt are markets that, uh, for solar energy at least, we've been talking about them for years, I would say decades by now. And in the past few years, things have moved and they've moved really quickly. So here with us we're uh, today, top ex experts that are going to give us an update of what's going on in the market. As you know, things have moved really, really quickly in the past couple of years or so. So with us today, I'd like to introduce you uh, first, uh, Youssef, uh, please, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and also what company and where you're joining from? Hello, yeah. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending where you are. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, being here. And thank you for ETA for hosting the event. Uh, my name is Youssef al zahir I'm the uh, Business Development uh, Director at Aquapower. Uh, I'm covering uh, markets like in Oman and Jordan, the top topic of today and also uh, Lebanon and Kuwait. Um, we do business development. We were working mostly in conventional over the past few years. Um, I used to be working in Saudi and Marafik, but then uh, in, in Aqua, we've started shifting as with a lot of the industry going more in towards uh, renewables. Uh, uh, today also with me, I'll just introduce quickly my colleague Ahmed Masoud, who is also based in Jordan and handling Jordan projects as well. Uh, Hi, nice to meet you all. Uh, but we can't see you though. Oh, oh. sorry. Hi. Hi, Ahmed. Okay. Hi, Ahmed. okay. So there is a two of you there. Okay. And you guys are in Dubai, yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Welcome the both of you, Yusef and Ahmed. Okay, Mohammed, introduce yourself quickly, please. Also from the same company, from what I can see. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining. My name is uh, Mohammed Atari. I work at Aqua Power Business Development Team. Uh, been with the company for the last uh, four years, and uh, uh, as you rightly said, so uh, this region has seen uh, uh, a very uh, fast uh, development in terms of uh, deployment of uh, renewable energy projects, and uh, the markets that are uh, uh, the subject of today, which is uh, which are uh, Egypt and Jordan, uh, are effectively uh, the markets that have seen um, most of the most of the developments in this area. So. Uh, uh, Let's. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'm, I'm happy to present uh, all of this uh, and uh, share it with you all. Thank you very much. Okay, Rory, please, could you introduce yourself a little bit and also uh, where are you based? Are you based in Dubai? Yes. So my name is Rory McCarthy. I'm based in Dubai. I'm the uh, chief uh, operator, uh, chief uh, commercial officer, and chief marketing officer for Yellow Door Energy. And I've got a background in uh, water before I joined into the uh, renewable business and solar energy. Excellent. And Thank you very much. Oh, Rory? Very, very happy to be here today. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I cut you off in that. Okay. And last but certainly not least, Rob, could you introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, good morning or good afternoon to everybody and, and thank you for having me also. Um, my name is Rob McNabb. I'm a partner with uh, the law firm Eversheds and I've been working in renewables now for the best part of 15 years. So I've adv advised on uh, getting on towards 40 gigawatts of, of renewables projects in various different countries, uh, but including uh, Jordan and Egypt, where we acted on uh, 10 of the 12 round one projects um, we advised two of the successful bidders in round two in, in Jordan, and we advised on uh, 20 of the, of the feed-in tariff round two projects uh, in Egypt, uh, and are involved in a number of the bidders for, for uh, the upcoming uh, program as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. As you can see, we have top experts today. All of them have been involved with these two markets. So the way this is going to go, there is uh, um, a lot of you guys today. There is four of you. So we're going to have 10 minute presentation and then follow by a really quick uh, Q&A. You know, we might not really get through a lot of questions, but if you have any burning questions, please send them through. First, I'd like to ask Yusef to prepare his presentation. We've had a few technical difficulties where we were trialing this, so I hope it works now. If not, then we also have, you know, some. So please, Yusef, prepare your presentation. And as I said, if you guys have some burning questions you can ask, I know there is four of them, so you're very likely to get some of the answers from them. Uh, but we're going to do our utmost to try and answer questions for a little while. Okay, can you put that in a large screen and also make sure to um, unmute yourself? Okay, can you hear us now? You, I can hear you, yes. And I can see your presentation. We do still have the same issues we had before, but let's, let's, let's go with it and hopefully we'll be able to see it. And just for everybody, we are recording this session and we're going to send the presentations to you. So don't worry, you know, don't despair if you can't see some of the things. 
you will see this presentation and you'll, you'll have the PDF. Go ahead, Youssef. Okay, um, thank you very much again for being here. So the, my slides is I'm just gonna quickly talk about Aqua and then I'll hand over to my colleague and talk about uh, Jordan and we'll try and um, share the slides going forward and try and stick hopefully within the quick time frame that we have. So, um, so today we're just gonna talk about Aqua Power in Jordan, then we're gonna quickly talk about Sitchko, which is the company that we co-own in, in Jordan. And then we quickly sort of give a brief flavor about Jordan and then uh, about the, the, uh, the market segmentation in Jordan, what's the renewable sector look like and how diverse is the capacity and then going, uh, going forward from there. So Aquapower is, uh, is just a company overall and uh, it has 29 gigawatts of electricity globally, our portfolio. Uh, it's, it's very big in desalination. It's about the largest private owner of desalination projects in the world. Uh, it has about 50 assets. It's now in almost 11 countries and have a portfolio of about $40 billion. Of that portfolio, about 22% uh, percent is renewable assets. Um, so it shows that the high commitment of the company to go into renewable. Uh, we have a staff of more than 3,000 now. It's very diverse and have a lot of nationalities being in Jordan in different countries in the world. Uh, and of course, the localization is about 60%. Uh, the company entered Jordan in between, between 2009-2010 uh, and then it partnered with Sitchko, uh, where is the Aqua acquired uh, almost half stake of uh, Sitchko. Sitchko was a uh, company owned uh, by the government. Uh, Aqua entered into, in, entered into it, took uh, control and then over time uh, started adding more assets uh, into Sitchko and then take over, not taking over operation. Uh, so I'll hand over now to the next slide. If you want to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the electricity sector in Jordan started uh, at 1967 as the Jordan Electricity Authority. Then um, uh, it, so it was divided into transmission and uh, generation. NEPCO was founded in 1996. Sitchko was founded in 1999. All of them were uh, governmental entities. And um, uh, yeah, moving forward. Okay. So Sitchko assets mainly are, uh, uh, first of all, we have the Aqaba Thermal Power Station uh, in the south of Jordan. We have the same Thermal Power Station in, uh, in Zarqa region, in, in, in the middle of Jordan. And we have Rehab near Erbil. We have Risha uh, at the east of Jordan. We have uh, uh, some assets uh, like in Marka, in South Amman, Karak, Ibrahimiya, and Hofa Wind, which are actually one of the first wind plants in the Middle East. They, they were uh, established. They were uh, um, uh, operational uh, uh, since the, the 80s. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is just an outline of where they were in different locations. Uh, go through there. Uh, and just one point here, which is emphasized of Aquapower, is that wherever uh, Aquapower invests in new assets in Jordan, the operation and maintenance is fully done by Sitchko to kind of make sure that the local content is adhered to. Yeah, so the um, uh, interconnection system in Jordan is, uh, is composed of two main parts, the generating power stations, which we uh, discussed uh, uh, a couple of slides ago, and the transmission network, which is 132 kV and the 400 kV. Um, we have also the 230 kV uh, uh, to 400 kV tie lines with Syria, which uh, provides up to 700 megawatts. And we have also the tie line with uh, Egypt, about uh, 500, uh, can, uh, can take up to 550 megawatts. So uh, now the electricity market segmentation is divided as, uh, as can be seen in the presentation. We have the policy maker, uh, which is Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, MEMR. Uh, we have the regulator, uh, which is the EMRC, Energy and Mineral Regulatory Commission. We have generation, which is done by Sitchko, uh, SEPCO, which is Samra Electricity uh, uh, Production uh, uh, electric Power Production Company. We have different IPPs. We have also uh, renewable and wind, uh, renewable including wind and solar, mm -hmm. and we have interconnection. Mm -hmm. And transmission, of course, is done by NEPCO, the, which is always the, the case of a single uh, buyer. Um, they are the off-taker, actually, at all the plants. Mm -hmm. And distribution is divided into three regions, uh, JEPCO, which is, um, in, uh, in, which is uh, responsible for um, distribution in the south of Jordan. We have ITCO, uh, 
uh, and we have the jet code. Yeah, uh, a quick uh, summary here also. Uh, uh, the national energy strategy covering Jordan requirements for 2015 to 2025, it was uh, finally decided that um, too many uh, dependence of Jordan on the exterior uh, uh, power demands. Jordan was importing around 95 to 98% of its uh, energy, uh, energy uh, fuel from outside. And uh, it, it was needed that uh, we, we go with uh, more uh, uh, reliance on, on local uh, sources like renewables and also, uh, for example, the oil shale because it is a local resource, which, uh, which is a, a big quantity that can be used. And here is a power, uh, the current power operational phase current power plants. And here we can see in this picture uh, an interesting fact that although we are increasing the renewable energy uh, capacity, uh, we also see that in the last um, two, two years, we see that uh, um, the reliance on natural gas is growing very high, uh, although the renewable, uh, renewables, renewable assets are also increasing. This means that we need also more renewable energy uh, to compensate this uh, this demand, the increase in this demand. So, as uh, we said, um, moreover, the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Law (REE) law it was passed and approved by the um, Parliament of Jordan in uh, 2012. Um, it was the first in the region to allow investors to develop grid-connected uh, plants, utility-scale plants. Um, uh, this, uh, the target was to reach 10% of uh, energy mix uh, by renewables in uh, 2023. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, net metering was also introduced uh, for small renewable energy. Yeah. And there was an initiative to, uh, to cover almost all the mosques in Jordan with the solar power. Uh, it started in 2015. Uh, Rooftops, uh, it was rooftop systems. It was based on multiple tenders for local contractors. And it was also funded by the government for around uh, $50 million. Uh, and uh, yeah, for now we have uh, the portfolio that was, uh, uh, that was discussed in the uh, middle of 2018. What we have in operation now is around 533 megawatts of solar and 179 of wind. And uh, there is also, as you see in construction, 72. 720 megawatts and in financial flow. And there was also in the pipeline 800 megawatts of wind, 800 megawatts of solar, uh, including the round three, but uh, not all of them were uh, implemented. Yeah. And uh, now we're going to talk uh, quickly about the Green Corridor project, which is uh, the, um, enhancing and reinforcing the transmission in Jordan in order to compensate for the addition of uh, renewable energy. Uh, capacity which is increasing uh, dramatically in the last two three years, which required the grid to be improved. And uh, we have three phases. The first phase was to improve, to uh, update, uh, sorry, to upgrade the substation in Mahan to a 400 kV. And uh, the second phase was also to uh, add the converters. And the third phase uh, is to connect uh, Mahan, uh, two parts to connect Mahan to Hakaba, to uh, sorry to Katrana. And then to connect um, uh, Katrana to um, uh, Queen Ali International Airport substation in order to connect uh, South Jordan to uh, North Jordan with a more strong uh, grid. Yeah. And then, in, so just uh, on the, uh, we saw the, the background of, of the renewables in Jordan in the way, and there's been three rounds so far, both in solar and in, in wind. Uh, it's been quite successful. All 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 rounds were oversubscribed. We're in the middle of round three at the moment, and we we can see this was really very early in the stage in round one, where before GCC started having renewable projects. So uh, we quickly saw the prices dropping uh, quite a lot, and now even going down. You can see from almost sixteen cents in round one, going all the way down to even point two point four cent or two point five cent in the latest round. So. We see a dramatic drop. It's been good because Jordan was the first market where this came in. It made uh, complete sense for Jordan because it lacked any uh, domestic sources of fuel. So it was a way of, of achieving kind of um, independence. So we can see that going forward that renewables is still going to be important. 
uh, and we see a point, uh, quite a growth for it, even though uh, we're still in the round three now. Uh, and uh, there's also been, a, as mentioned, as Ahmed mentioned earlier, that uh, with the uh, with the entrance of renewables also comes an important factor is energy storage, and that we see is going to be an enabler for more renewables and more solar energy to come in going forward. There's been the first tender now by Jordan, uh, that's still under, uh, ongoing. We've seen the upgrades in the green corridor, so we do see, although there's a bit of uh, maybe a slowdown, but we do see renewables going forward, especially solar, is still going to be a big factor going forward for Jordan uh, to keep reducing the imports of fuel. Uh, and uh, as we've seen in the latest kind of uh, market development, there was a temporary hold on renewable projects because NEPCO is trying to regroup and plan for the next further rounds going forward. Although there was uh, a, a bit of maybe a slight uh, uh, stall from the developers, uh, the market does see and NEPCO, NEPCO is, re, is keeps emphasizing the message that this is a, street, a strategic kind of review and uh, to look at current challenges in terms of dispatch and uh, managing the peak load and, and managing the availability of the resource and, and the, um, the, the supply of it. So we see that uh, this is going to be something going forward. It's important for Jordan, even though Jordan has maybe one of the highest uh, thresholds of renewables in the region, uh, in terms of capacity, we still see that it's still a big, uh, uh, there's still a big requirement to ship fossil fuels that are being imported, which still accounts for more than 90% of the electricity actually generated in Jordan. So renewable has a big place and we see it as still being a very big part of the story for Jordan going forward. Um, and Ahmed, I just have to let you know that, oh, okay, perfect. We have very little time. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're timing it here on our side also. So uh, that was about it. So uh, hopefully it was a bit brief, but um, that's um, well, yeah. so thank you so much for your listening. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, both Yusuf and Ahmed. There is an hour missing from Aquapower at the end in your email. If you just uh, so you know, guys, we will give you, we will send you this presentation so you will have all of access to these details. Thank you very much. If I can ask you to stop sharing this screen and I'm going to ask Mohammed to share his, just to make sure we are more or less on time because we still have um, a few presentations to go through. And I would ask you, Yusuf Ahmed, would you mind answering some of the questions that people are sending? There is four for you, but by writing, you can actually write on a response. Okay, Mohammed, can you make that into a large screen? Perfect. Off you go. Make sure you unmute your microphone. There, there you go. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Belen. And uh, uh, I'm going to skip the presentation of Aqua Power, as I believe uh, Youssef has uh, done that already. Um, so I'm um, here uh, today. I would like to uh, share with you all uh, some uh, market information about the renewable energy sector in Egypt, but also what, uh, most importantly, the solar energy opportunities. Um, so for the people who don't know or who are not, or who don't, uh, are not familiar with Egypt's uh, market, it's, uh, it's a market which is pretty similar to uh, the countries that are in the region. So there's a government utility uh, called uh, EEHC and uh, there's a subsidiary of EEHC uh, called EETC which is responsible for the transmission. Uh, most of the power plants are actually owned by EEHC and uh, very few now, but uh, we're, we're seeing more and more of them coming are on the IPP basis. Um, and then EEHC also controls uh, on top of the generation, the transmission distribution, uh, uh, well, partly this, the distribution of the electricity uh, in the country. Um, in terms of uh, uh, institutions, uh, so uh, NREA, which is the new and renewable energy authority has been created uh, in order to uh, help promote renewable energy and to meet the country's targets. Um, and uh, as you can see uh, in the mix of the uh, country energy, so the renewables are still, uh, what, as of 2015, there were just 2%, but now I think there are around 7-8% uh, uh, thanks to uh, the upcoming uh, so, uh, Ben Ban uh, Solar Park and also uh, the two wind projects that are being built uh, by uh, IPPs and also by uh, NREA. Um, just to give you a quick uh, look into the in into the load, the electricity load uh, in the country. So in the first graph, uh, you can see 
uh, in 24 hours of the day where most of the demand is coming in Egypt. So it's coming uh, during the, the peak is coming uh, after like sunset hours. Um, and this means uh, that uh, obviously it's not ideal for solar, but most of the demand in the day can be covered by solar power. And uh, this is also very important because uh, if you combine the solar PV, for example, with batteries, or uh, ideally if you, if you use CSP, then that would be the perfect match uh, in the context of, uh, I mean, uh, taking the view of the load that we're, that we're seeing. Uh, because you only need uh, most of the electricity three, four hours after sunset, and then you'll be able to cover the load. Um, another key uh, and important uh, information uh, that most people I'm sure hear is that people say that there is a, a, an excess of uh, energy in Egypt. Sometimes it goes up to eight gigawatts. So uh, installed capacity is more, uh, is more than eight gigawatt than the demand. But, uh, uh, and, and then people uh, are, are looking at more projects coming in Egypt and asking the question, how is that possible? Um, so basically there's two reasons to that. The, the first one is uh, th that most of the power plants, the old conventional power plant will start to be decommissioned uh, very soon, which means that there is a very large uh, uh, capacity that's going to be missing in the next two to three years that is now being gradually replaced by uh, the the new conventional, but also uh, the new uh, renewable power plants. The second reason is that, uh, as you know, all the countries have commitments in order to have a share of renewable energy in their mix. Uh, and, and that's why uh, the solar and the wind have been uh, uh, heavily promoted in the last, uh, at least the last uh, three, four years in, uh, in Egypt. Um, in this slide, I want to show you uh, the solar resource in the country. So. On the left side, you can see the GHI, the Global Horizontal Irradiance. And on the right side, you can see the uh, Direct Normal Irradiance. Uh, for those who don't know, so the, the GHI is the metric that we use in order to be able to estimate how much energy we can get out of solar PV, photovoltaics. Whereas the DNI is the metric or the resource that is mostly uh, predominant in the context of concentrated solar power. And as we can see, if you see the the, the numbers uh, in the legend, the, uh, Egypt has one of the most uh, promising and rich resource in both GHI and DNI, which means that the country, uh, if it combines solar PV with solar CSP and with storage, that would, it, it can actually, in principle, cover all its needs solely from solar power. And uh, I'm not, I know it's not, this is a not session about wind, but uh, uh, along the Gulf of Suez area, it's one of the windiest sites in the world. So if you, com if you, if you combine all these three, Egypt can run actually 100% on renewable energy. Um, now in terms of numbers um, for the solar uh, energy projects in Egypt and what is in the pipeline that has been announced at least. So Egypt wants to reach 20% of its uh, generated uh, energy uh, coming from the renewables by 2022. That means that there is a pipeline of uh, uh, at least 15 uh, gigawatts uh, by 2022. Well, as we know, so sometimes these numbers are exaggerated. The most of these targets uh, are not likely to be met, but at least uh, we can see that uh, so far, 30-40% uh, of that target is, uh, is on the works. So it's either under construction or uh, under bidding process. Um, in terms of uh, regulatory framework and how these projects are going to be tendered, so there's a big portion that is uh, going to be undertaken by the government itself. And there is a, a slightly smaller portion that is going to be tendered either in forms of, of bids, so competitive uh, bids. So, so far uh, there has been uh, uh, in the context of the solar energy, so Common Bull, which was tendered uh, in August last year which uh, we were lucky to be the, 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 the preferred bidder uh, uh, as uh, it was announced uh, earlier this year. Uh, and then uh, we have submitted our qualification for the uh, 600 megawatt PV uh, or 200 megawatt, it depends on the capacity that might be changing in West Nile area. And uh, we know that the government is working on a 100 megawatt CSP project, uh, uh, which will be also in West Nile area. That makes sense according to the solar map. So this is uh, in terms of the bits. Uh, there is the fade-in tariff program that everybody knows. So Egypt now has the biggest solar PV park in the world. 
which is uh, being built and uh, it is gradually being um, uh, commissioned. Uh, Aqua Power has three projects in, in the Benban area for a total capacity of 165.5 megawatt peak. And uh, the total park uh, has, uh, has uh, 1.8 gigawatts. So there are 30 developers who have uh, uh, juxtapositioned uh, uh, plots where the, all of them are building solar power plants. And some of them are already include by facial. Uh, some of them include uh, the latest technologies uh, when it comes to uh, solar PV. Then the third framework that Egypt is doing is the captive PPA. So there's a number of uh, industrial companies that now uh, have seen the advantage that the solar PV is giving, especially in terms of uh, reducing the cost and uh, being reliable in the long term. Uh, so there's uh, uh, aluminium companies, there is uh, other industrial companies that are actually tendering now and trying to get in touch with developers in order to directly uh, get the electricity uh, either at the uh, at the level of their sites or um, either uh, use, utilizing uh, ETC grid. Um, and then, uh, last but not least, so the, as I said earlier, so there's a government-owned projects that have been developed by uh, by ETC, uh, uh, which are in the range of three to four gigawatts. Um, some of them, uh, most of most of it is wind, but there are also some other solar projects. I'm only focusing here on the utility scale, obviously. Uh, there, are, there is a lot of uh, uh, CNI projects that are happening in, in Egypt. I think Egypt is the third, second or the third market for CNI uh, solar in, in this region. So uh, it's a very promising market in that regard. And that's it. Thank you very much, Mohammed. It was a great presentation. And I uh, would like to thank you. If you could stop sharing the screen in exact time, so perfect. Um, and I will ask uh, Rory, next presentation is from Rory, to go ahead and also share your screen so that you can prepare for your presentation. Remember to take um, your microphone off mute. Thank you, Youssef, for answering those questions so promptly. Uh, Mohammed, we invite you to do the same, actually, to, to, to who? Since we don't, we're not going to have a lot of time thereafter, if you could just help by like, answering the questions that people send, that would be greatly appreciated. And in line with this request to the speakers, you know because you've seen that your, your questions have been answered, so please go ahead and send them. Uh, Rory, we're ready for you. Just make sure that you um, take the microphone you unmute your microphone and we can see the presentation perfectly. Great, good to go. Um, so again, my name is Rory McCarthy and, and uh, have the opportunity to talk a little bit about the Jordan and Egyptian market and also about what, uh, what, what makes something viable for solar. And we've had some great presenters so far. So um, We've lost you there, you've gone mute, uh, Rory. Yeah, Sorry. there we go. No, don't worry. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Yellow Door Energy, success factors for solar, and Egypt and Jordan solar opportunities, and is the, is the solar opportunity for what kind of companies would consider solar and why would they consider solar? And we've had some great information that's come forth in terms of utility-based solar. There's been a little bit of discussion on commercial industrial. Now, if I look at who Yellow Door is, is our story started in 2015, and we're focused on generating uh, solar energy into the commercial and industrial space. So we have technical capabilities, and we also provide the development and the financing through a solar leasing system or power purchase agreements. Now, we offer to customers the ability to reduce their costs and we provide them a contract that will save them money without any capital expenditure and without any operating expense. So if we look at recently, we had a, a very big day for ourselves at the end of January, January 28th, where we had some major investors join us and uh, that includes IFC, Mitsui Corporation and Equinor, which is Norwegian oil. So we're a well-backed company and we, we um, this was one of the largest venture investments in the Middle East in the renewable energy space, which we're very proud of. Our customers, again, we focus on the commercial and industrial segment, and we've just thrown a mix up here of different customers that we've worked with in the UAE and in Jordan. So in terms of success factors for solar in the 
Jordanian and the Egyptian marketplace? Well, the first is the irradiation piece, as my colleagues have correctly informed the market of. And of course, that differs from country to country. If you take a country like the UAE, the irradiation uh, position in terms of kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak will be, say, 1,400. But if, if you're in Egypt or if you're in Jordan, it can be between uh, 1,750 to 2,100, depending on how red the map is, as was uh, shown to us earlier. So the market potential comes down to the price of power. It comes down to the radiation in terms of the amount of solar that's available. And of course, does legislation support solar in that market? So are there factors like wheeling? Can you transport power freely? Is it available? What are the levels of loss in terms of wheeling on the transmission line? And is there net metering available? So when you use power and you use more power than you require, will the local authority give you a credit on that and can you use it in future? So if we look at again, Egypt, for example, irradiation, and there was a very good graph presented earlier, the high level of radiation makes Egypt an attractive market. If I take the, the Gulf countries where we get sort of 300 to 325 days of, of, of sun per annum, the irradiation levels are lower due to the heat. Now heat, as we know, isn't necessarily as efficient in terms of generating solar energy. So the market potential that, that we see in Egypt, Egypt is currently generating a lot of power of what we would call from dirty energy sources. So natural gas, oil products, coal, solar and wind at the moment is, is less than 2%. They have an ambitious goal to change that. And they're very, very focused on the fact they know they have a problem with air pollution. They know they have a problem with the way that power is generated. And of course, recent announcements by uh, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, are they removing subsidies uh, from power and Egypt's committed to that. So they, over the next three to four years, you'll see the removal of subsidies from power for Egypt. So one of the key things that we do is, is we, we build, we own, we operate, and we provide that solution to customers without them having to invest in it. Now, Egypt has some ambitious targets, moving to 20% of renewable by 2022, which we feel is a, a very ambitious target as to, to where they are now, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great goal to, to move forward from. So if we look at the um, price point, and this price point that's on the screen in front of you is demonstrated in Egyptian pounds per kilowatt hour. What we see is a price point that you can see between 2018 moving up to 22 of doubling, actually more than doubling in terms of critical position. Now, if you look at the price of diesel, there are parts of Egypt where you cannot actually get access to the grid. So where people are relying pretty much 100% on diesel. So Solus immediately becomes a, a, a viable opportunity for generating energy. And in the commercial space, it looks very healthy as well. Industrial at the moment, it doesn't work in Egypt at the current price point because of those subsidies. But we see that changing certainly in the near future. In terms of who should look at solar energy and if solar energy is right for your business, anyone that has a roof of 4,000 square meters or larger or is consuming 700,000 kilowatt hours should examine if solar is right for them. They have the ability to save money immediately. They can control the energy costs, not just now, but they can control the energy costs against future tariff increases. So from a, a finance perspective and a capital budgeting perspective, that becomes very attractive because you can potentially control your energy costs for 15 to 20 years or as long as that particular lease can be. You also have the uh, carbon benefits as well of reducing uh, emissions, cleaner air, um, and a whole host of benefits I think that are, are very, very valuable. So when we look at Jordan by comparison as a, as a marketplace, uh, Jordan's a little bit different. They're certainly a little more advanced in that position where they are on solar. They have currently 10% already 
of their energy requirements coming from renewable energy. And they have a goal to change that very quickly to drive that up to 20%. So currently there's a, a pause in terms of the legislation at the moment. They're revisiting their current energy policy, but we see that as moving forward in the future and advancing. We don't see that being on hold. Jordan is very advanced in terms of its wheeling ability, its net metering ability, and the way that the, the different local power authorities are able to work together. Now, as pointed out earlier, 90% of energy currently generated in Jordan is by oil or natural gas. So there is a lot of potential for solar and the radiation levels, again, like Egypt, are very, very healthy between 1750 to 2050 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak. So reinforced is the message by the king of the 20% target of renewable energy by 2020. Again, it's 10% currently, so it's an aggressive focus to advance that forward, and uh, we're very supportive of that uh, initiative. So in terms of, as I mentioned before, who should look at the benefits of solar energy, we put one particular customer, and this is an example, specialty hospital, where we've used wheeling, where we've actually purchased land and we've actually installed a solar facility and we transport that energy into where the uh, hospital is located. Now a hospital, for example, it's not just about the cost of power, it's also about the availability of power and the quality of power, which is critical. And when you're a hospital and you have some very high tech equipment and very sensitive equipment that uh, can, you know, obviously be damaged if there's any spikes, that is critical. So we have a very good reference and we have many others in Jordan as well. So again, what actually works for solar is high radiation levels, high electricity prices, and expected rising costs in both Jordan and Egypt make this a viable market, both in the commercial industrial piece, residential and utility. And of course, without favorable regulations and support from the government on renewable energy, um, that won't work. So we believe the future is bright for solar in both those countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rory. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's always good to understand also the commercial and financial, the rooftop part of things, because it's a big piece of the puzzle as well. And oftentimes we focus on the utility scale stuff and then to deny the fact that actually in aggregate, we're talking about a lot of power that can be you know, generated uh, by companies themselves and by the people who are using it themselves. So thank you very much. If I could ask you to stop sharing and you've got all of everybody's details, including obviously Rory's in his presentation, you will get them in a few days. And last but not least, Rob, you've done a lot of work in both these markets um, at the legal level. So we want to hear from your perspective, you know, what uh, happened and what is next for these markets. So if you could share your screen and unmute your microphone. And we're doing good for time. So you guys, what's happened to the questions? You know, the speakers have actually just gone through them, replied to all of them. You need to send more through, I'm afraid. Uh, hopefully we'll get five minutes at the end to answer some questions. Could you go to display settings and for us so that we can see it in a large screen because at the moment we can see like oh. doubled up the screen or go to the top where it says display settings yeah yep. let's see what options we have there um, i'm not really sure which one it is actually um let's try it again okay mm. did that did this happen before maybe it did uh no Okay, Arthel is actually telling me that you have to press where it says swap. So open it again. Oh, that's better. Okay, can you put that in a large screen? Yay, here we go. It worked perfectly. Are. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. No, no problem. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, I think there's been three excellent presentations there that I think are very accurately summarize the position and a bit of the history in terms of in terms of these two markets so so rather than repeat that here what, I, what i'll try and focus on now is maybe where we see or i see uh, these two markets going uh, and where the opportunities may be uh, moving forward now i think as part of doing that it's probably important to understand some key points in terms of the journey for both of these markets in terms of how we've got to 
where we are at the moment because I think it's it's broadly a similar story with with Jordan and Egypt. You know, Jordan obviously went first, but they they followed a similar pattern, and that is um, as as has been mentioned, initial rounds of government feed-in tariff projects. Uh, so these are projects where the price for which the power is being sold has been predetermined. So there's, there's no price competition, or there has been no price competition in the early rounds. So round one in, um, in, in Jordan and round one and two in, in Egypt. And both countries have developed what, prob well, in their early rounds were by modern standards, smaller projects. So in Jordan in round one, it was, uh, 10 to 50 megawatt projects and in Egypt, um, 50 megawatt projects, which I think contrasts with other markets in the MENA region, such as uh, you know, the DWAR programs uh, and Morocco, which have gone straight to having much, much bigger projects. Um, but with both of these countries, both in Jordan and in Egypt, they've, they've been collected in, in particular areas so that they can, that the smaller projects combine to make uh, bigger projects of I think 200 megawatts in round one in Jordan and two gigawatts of solar in round two in, in Egypt. Um, but as I said, divided into smaller slices, which has meant there's been much more opportunity for a greater number of developers and IPPs to move into these markets than there has been in, in certain other uh, jurisdictions. Um, I think it's probably worth noting that all of these initial rounds in both countries have been funded by development banks. And I think it's, um, it, it, it will be interesting moving forward to see the extent to which international and local finance begins to move uh, into these markets, either as construction finance or to uh, refinance some of these projects. And I'll touch upon that um, in a moment. Um, but then what we saw in both of these markets is after the success of the initial rounds, the governments moved to price auctions for their tender program and they moved to much bigger projects. And I think, you know, it's been openly stated that the aim in both, in, in, in both jurisdictions in doing that has been to get the price down. And you know, the, the, both governments have been very successful in getting the prices down uh, significantly. Um, you know, we're, we're below uh, three cents per kilowatt hour in both of these jurisdictions now. And I think the Egyptian government has stated an aim for the Western Nile project to get that down below 2.5. So very significant price reductions in a very uh, short uh, period of time. Um, so what I think that means moving forward is I think we, we will see a, a, an emergence of a number of different markets in each of these countries. So I think there will be a continuation of the government programs in both Jordan and in Egypt, but these projects will continue at the very large or continue towards the very large scale as we have with the 600 megawatt program uh, for West of Nile. Now, what I think this is going to mean is that there's going to be a smaller group of IPPs and developers that are going to be able to compete in terms of developing those very large uh, government projects. Um, the reason being is access to capital and just you know the, the experience in developing projects of that size. So whereas historically in both markets we've seen uh, a fairly large number of IPPs being able to bid for and win um, the, the projects when they were sized at around 50 megawatts. I think that's going to be a smaller number of developers that are going to be able to compete and win for the for the much bigger projects. And obviously, when you're giving out one project per round as opposed to 25, there, there's, there is a bit less to go around in, in any event. So what then I think that will mean as a second track of projects in both of these markets is, and as has already been alluded to, the emergence of the private PPA or the CNI um, market. And obviously now we have mechanisms, wheeling and net metering mechanisms in, uh, in both jurisdictions in order to facilitate those sorts of projects. Now I think there are still some um, issues to be worked through in terms of how those regulations work for them to be um, fully bankable, uh, 
for example, in Egypt, the, the wheeling charges are in future years are variable and not fixed, and that that you know it, it, it causes some nervousness amongst the banks. But what we've seen, it, it, taking Jordan as an example, is those sorts of issues being sort of resolved and worked through. So I think we will, the governments will get their um, wheeling and net metering regulations. Uh, to a bankable standard that will see the emergence of the private PPA and the CNI uh, market in both of these uh, both of these jurisdictions, and you know we, we're being approached by um, a number of developers and off takers that are looking to do um, you know fairly large projects in, in in the markets. For example, I think the Vodafone 100 megawatt project in uh, Egypt is fairly well. Uh, well known about, and the the the, uh, the army hundred megawatt project in Jordan in Jordan likewise. Um, but I do also think that within the private PPA sphere, you will also see uh, an emergence of two of two different markets. So I think you will see the more utility size uh, projects. So you know the fifty megawatt plus. So the big off takers such as um vodafone mining companies uh and so on and so forth with with big power demands and then we will see the smaller kind of 10 mega sub 10 megawatts um uh, private ppa market emerging as well and there are some interesting models that are being looked at in respect of that market around um aggregation of projects in order to secure bigger um uh, funding tranches and in order to mitigate the the, the risk of the uh, the credit risk of the of, of the off taker so uh, in, in, yeah in summary i think moving forward we'll see the continuation of the of the government uh, projects but with a fewer uh, bidders able to compete for those uh, but with others moving into the utility scale uh, and aggregation scale of smaller uh, private ppa markets And that was it for me. Wow, Rob, that was really, really short and succinct. Thank you very much. Okay, I would like to ask you to please stop sharing your screen. And, uh, um, oh, now I can see you all. Excellent. Okay, so we have two things going here. From the one side, we talked about the utility scale projects that are, you know, uh, talked by the government. And I think we had a really good idea of what's happening in Egypt, what's happening in Jordan, you know, what were the tenders before and what are they expected now? You see if we can only see like your forehead. So you both get a little bit closer, excellent. And then we talked as well about the rooftop side, you know, the commercial and industrial and the private PPAs. These both things came together. So first question I'd like to ask and is reflecting some of the questions that you've already gotten. Uh, I will try to get to some of those. I, I reckon we have about five, uh, six minutes. Is where are the opportunities for storage and what are the opportunities signifying at like what um, are they going to be like small batteries, you know, for sort of like more grid flexibility or is it going to be larger projects like CSP projects? Uh, what do you see and where? Um, I'm going to start with Mohammed and then move uh, maybe to Yusuf and see what you guys see. Because this is more uh, something about um, utility scale first and then we'll move on to the more the commercial stuff with Rory. So Mohammed, what is your answer? Okay, so there was a lot of questions I've seen uh, uh, actually about batteries. Yeah. Uh, it's like the topic of the hour. Um, so in, in, in the context of, of uh, utility scale, right? So most of the usage of the battery is, is not actually linked to generation. They are used obviously they're coupled with solar PV or, or with wind in general. But most of the batteries usage uh, is used uh, in order to uh, stabilize the grid or for peak shaving or for frequency control. Um, because the batteries have the advantage to uh, charge and discharge very quickly and uh, they actually stabilize the intermittency of renewable energy projects in general. So um, in, in terms of opportunities and deployment, so, so far as uh, Youssef has mentioned, so there's an ongoing bid for uh, uh, 30 uh, uh, megawatt capacity uh, storage uh, in Jordan. I think that's the first one in the region for the lithium ion batteries. Um, in, in Egypt, there is nothing that has been officially announced yet, uh, but I think Egypt has, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, backup uh, base load at the moment, so they don't need actually to, uh, I mean, the grid is, is still stable enough and can take renewable energy intermi intermittency uh, 
at least to a certain degree. Um, and then I think the, the question should revolve more around storage in general. And, and there in here, I'd like also to highlight the CSP, uh, which is, in my opinion, best suited for generation uh, uh, purposes. In some instances, it can displace actually base load application. Um, as uh, some of the questions have been raised, so uh, we are actually building the biggest SP project here in Dubai, and it, it, it has the ability to generate electricity 24 hours. And the price is, 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 is similar, if not lower, than uh, that of conventional power in, in, in the same country. So, so yeah, so there are opportunities for, for storage. We, uh, as, a, as a developer of, of generating assets, we believe that CSP makes more sense, but also we are also participating in, in, in batteries. But I, all, I, I think that solar PV plus battery will have a different application and uh, batteries are more suited to stabilize the grid uh, uh, more than anything else. This is at least for the utility scale, but then again, on a smaller scale, the, the, the usage is different. Excellent, thank you very much. This is a very different case in Jordan, I understand, right? Um, um, Egypt and Jordan have different cases in terms of how much um, storage can be added really in the grid or is necessary in order to stabilize the grid. Is that correct? Because they're in... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean <coughs> the, the, the Egypt grid is not, is not, uh, is fine so far. So. Uh, don't forget that also they are connected to uh, uh, they're connected to uh, uh, Jordan. So Jordan and, and Egypt are connected. They are also building a line to connect to Saudi Arabia as well. So, um, but uh, Jordan, I will let uh, Youssef speak about uh, the the grid status and uh, what yeah. what are the reasons behind the the, the the battery storage tender that is ongoing now. Go ahead, Youssef. Yeah, no, you're quite right. The the, the battery, although it's um, it's, it's, it's a hot topic. It's uh, like Mohammed mentions, there are different applications. And uh, people, when they think of storage, I think they straight away go to the plane storage and not, not the grid stability and frequency response and so on. But in Jordan, uh, it's, it's quite simple why they're doing it. It's because uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, in addition to the IPP projects, you know, so the mega projects which get tenders so of 50 megawatts and up to whatever, 100 megawatts. But, a lot of the people in Jordan are putting solar panels on their rooftops as well, so on top of the, the places. So, so what the grid operator is having uh, an, an issue is like what they face in the US, what they, the famous is called the duck curve. So the problem is, is that everybody has this, um, everybody has PV generation. So midday, the, uh, the capacity goes down, or the, what the grid operator doesn't need to dispatch much electricity, but then uh, when the sun goes down, uh, close to five or six o'clock in the evening, just as the sun is going down, the demand starts going up uh, because of people going home, going back home, putting on their homes and that. So the, and because the, the base capacity is already switched off, that makes a very sharp spike. So actually with more renewables coming in online, it causes that, that spike to be even worse. So, uh, so what, what, what storage there is an actual necessity, not for the storage for 24 hours, actually, they need just storage just for one or two hours during that peak time just to address that requirement. So that's why it's there. And that's why it's, it could be economical to, even though batteries are still not that cheap, that it helps them to meet that requirement. Because if they don't do that, then they would have to put expensive peak generation. Uh, you know, gas turbines are only operated for a few hours a day, and that's when it's very expensive. So in that very vague window where it applies in Jordan, it kind of makes sense right now just to address that short requirement. So we see that's going to happen. And other countries, when they more and more renewable comes online, when other countries we see that allow rooftops on their homes, like this happening in Oman and starting in Saudi, uh, starting in UAE as well, although there's no like feed-in tariff. But when you see that happening, it's going to be more of a problem uh, when renewables start reaching a capacity of being 20 or 30 percent of the grid, then you'll start seeing batteries, uh, lithium batteries, becoming something of, of interest. But right now, as Mohammed Atari said, if you want to look at it purely right now today investment, the, the best storage uh, technology is CSP by far uh, because of the economies that it's reached right now. And if you have to remember, the, the CSP storage has, has fall, fallen a lot with just relatively few projects. So the more that comes on, it's gonna go down more. 
just in terms of the question was asked, the other possible battery technology that could come on would probably be in Lebanon because the demographics, or the, the, the statistics works there because electricity is quite expensive, uh, a lot of off-grid solutions, so it might be viable there as well uh, first before other countries. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yusef. Okay, I'm going to ask a question now to Rory. Um, it's the same question, really. In terms of storage for more of the rooftop side, um, I want to ask you two questions. One, what do you see the role of storage? And second, what do you see the role of cross-borders corporate PPAs? Which is something that I want to ask also Rob after, you know, because we're starting to hear a lot about this, you know, whether you can get cheaper power, you know, just producing as well. And I want to see your opinion on this whether that changes at all, you know, the, the rooftop, you know, um, mission, if you like, that you have, you know, when you can just have a plant elsewhere. So go yeah. for it. I'll, I'll answer the last question first. So with, with, the, with, with the cross-border PPA, certainly from a commercial standpoint and industrial standpoint, what we're seeing is more multinational companies are asking us, hey, you know, we're doing business with you in the UAE, we're doing business with you in Jordan. Uh, we want to also roll out in Pakistan. We also want to roll out um, in other countries. And what they are looking for is they're looking for a mirror type of contract and a mirror type of time frame. Um, and they want, you know, similar to kind of, you know, tariffs. They want to try and standardize that. And that's obviously very difficult when you've got vast changes in legislation between the countries, vast changes in the rates of power. So that's the first thing in, in terms of cross-border PPAs, I think that is going to be difficult because, you know, you have countries that have very, very different rules and legislation and rules on getting a power generation license, taxation on power generation. Are you able to call it a tariff? Are you, do you have to label it an energy charge or a rental charge? There's a whole bunch of um, complex uh, minefields that you can get into there. So in terms of the battery piece, I think batteries, as, as everyone's keep saying, you know, it's very much the now uh, time and certainly lithium ion is, is leading the marketplace. But we see certainly in countries, if you pick sort of Jordan, you know, has a complex tariff structure in terms of that has the ability to have a different type of charge for different type of industries. If you take mining, for example, it has a different charging system to commercial. So where you have a situation where load sharing is an issue or time shifting is an advantage, that's where batteries could complement solar very effectively. For example, that would work very, very well in Lebanon where you could potentially do a hybrid diesel, hybrid solar type solution. Thank you very much. And last but not least, I'd like to ask a question to Rob actually about the PPA legal setups. Are we going to see PPAs like the ones in Europe with really short terms, you know, like four years, that thing is already a long uh, term in a corporate PPA or a private PPA. Would you expect different kinds of structures um, in the markets in Jordan and in Egypt? What did you expect to see? Okay, C can I just pick up on the on that on that on that last question as well? Because we're, yeah, we're act, um, working with a number of um, multinationals, so a large, you know, very well known IT company and a large online retailer in terms of their global their their global um renewables um private ppa position and i think rory is, is right is that a lot of the corporates are looking at this on a global scale but aren't looking to cross border any uh, any generation you know it, typically it's it's looked at within each country so if abc limited has 100 megawatt power demand in country x and it's looking at the you know how it procures 100 megawatts in country X rather than rather than moving it cross border, but but one I think interesting thing that we are seeing a lot, particularly with the RE100 companies, so these are the are the multinationals that are looking to be 100% uh, clean energy, is that they are increasingly look, increasingly looking to their supply chain now rather than their own demands, but actually looking to meet the qualification criteria by imposing. Um, clean energy requirements onto their onto their supply chain so we are therefore seeing um, some of the corporates pushing projects in jurisdictions not necessarily where they have their own footprint but where they have a large supply chain in order to meet uh, to meet the RE uh, 100 requirements um, 
in terms of the PPA structures themselves, I mean, I don't, I don't think that really has settled yet, and I don't think it necessarily needs to be a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, in, in uh, I think four years probably for the region is um, fairly tight in terms of time scale, um, but I think what what you may well see is longer term PPAs, but where the price is only fixed for a particular period, and you have a variable price on the tail of the of the PPA. Um, so it longer term, but it, I think the, the key question is how long is the price fixed for, and at what point do you move to a to a variable price, um, which yeah is is kind of one of the key commercial things that we're seeing kind of debated and negotiated on the projects um, at, at the moment. Unfortunately, we don't have much time, well, any more time really for answers, but I think we did a good job, you know, considering we, we've done like five, 10 minutes more than that actually of questions and answers. And you guys all have been answering the questions. So thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our speakers, Mohammed, Youssef, Ahmed, Rory and Rob. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, as you know, tomorrow we have one um, also about the MENA region and, you know, opportunities there. Thank you very much to Messia for helping us putting this together. They are our partners for this event. And I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.